We're rolling. Welcome to the House Dudes Podcast, where we invite you to follow us on our journey towards financial freedom using the power of real estate. I'm Jack Haas. And I'm Josh Koth. Here at House Dudes, we believe in a couple key principles. Number one, the best way to retain information is by teaching it to others. And number two, a rising tide lifts all boats. We're not competitors, we're a community. So let's get into some real estate investing. Well, we have Joshua Saunders on the Zoom call here tonight. And uh, Joshua, I'm just going to throw it quickly to you right off the bat. I warned you. Um, why don't you introduce yourself to our listeners? Absolutely. Jack, thanks for having me on. It's, it's neat to be on the uh, the House Dudes podcast. Uh, I said that right, right? The House Dudes, right? Yep, House yeah. Dudes. Perfect. And, um, you know, come and talk just about real estate investing and why as an advisor, I think that's super important um, as a, you know, really a diversified part of every portfolio. Um, but, you know, kind of my quick background is I'm a Navy pilot by trade. Um, I did that for 10 years on active duty, been in the reserves ever since. I actually get to retire this year. So I made it to the end. I retire in the first part of November. Um, I train Navy pilots uh, as a part-timer. So it's been a lot of fun. I get to do everything that eight-year-old Josh ever wanted to do, which has been a lot of fun. Yeah, that's, that's really neat. Well, thank you for your service to begin with. And um, yeah, yeah, you live in Top Gun, huh? I kind of did. Yeah, I've gotten to do yeah, roller coasters aren't much fun for me. If we, if yeah, seeing my kids going roller coasters is a lot of fun. Yeah, for me, it's not that exciting. It's kind of like doing it like uh, like everyday stuff. But I've I've been super blessed um, just to kind of get where I at. And um, you know, after I got off active duty, stayed in the reserves. I kind of went into the money management business, and I've kind of been through the whole gambit of it. I've had some successes and failures. You know, I started a hedge fund back in two thousand nine. So the worst day you could have ever started a hedge fund in the history of the world, probably maybe until two weeks ago. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've been in the you know, commodity, business, commodity and futures and I really wanted to uh, be a financial advisor. So I started to look at, you know, what kind of advice do people give and what kind of advice does Wall Street give? And as we've seen in the last couple of weeks, it was really what was great advice in January is really, really bad advice today or has performed poorly, if that makes right. sense. Yeah. And things move and change. And um, I, you know, like we were talking about before, I, I kind of joke that I'm the worst financial advisor ever because I don't love always pushing the products that I sell. Mm-hmm. I really recommend that clients should have a really good real estate portfolio. They should have some really good tax strategies inside that real estate portfolio and mix it in with the things that they, that they do. Um, so I'm excited to kind of dive into the, the tax side of real estate investing and how that you know, can affect some outcomes down the road. Yeah. Well, let's, let's dive right in then. You know, uh, we, we do get a little deferred tax break here now because of the whole coronavirus thing that's going on. But um, you were talking about some uh, pretty significant changes that, uh, for example, uh, something w- when it came to the real estate. Um, yeah, so, so a big one that's happened as of recently is, you know, before the Secure Act got passed in the, in the pre the, would be the Trump tax cuts, you kind of had um, the 50% de- depreciation that you got to accelerate. Well, it got fixed just when they passed the tax cuts, so now it's 100% depreciation. So there's some opportunities this year for some investors, if you're on the real estate side, to write down a whole bunch of depreciation. You can actually go back two years. Don't quote me on that. I think through two or three years. And so you can bring all that depreciation forward 100%. And, you know, if you if you made some capital improvements, you can depreciate all that stuff today. Show a very, very, very low income for 2020. Mm-hmm. Um, and the cool thing there is now you're, you, you guys talk about investing, using IRA money to uh, invest, right? Right. Well, great. Why don't we do a conversion on some of those assets and convert that to a Roth, right? Mm-hmm. You're showing zero income this year. So let's, man, let's pay that. Let's pay those taxes, you know, lo, that super low tax rate, right? So if you're showing zero income this year or, you know, theoretically right. you're showing zero income, let's bring that tax bracket down from 22 to 12 or to, you know, to seven or five, pay that stupid, that small tax. And then go turn right back around and invest. Net net, you're well ahead, right? So you'll never right. pay a dollar on that investment for the next, you know, 20, 30, 40 years, depending on your age, right? Mm-hmm. The only thing that to take to be considerate of is how's that money gonna come out when you have to start taking RMDs and how are you gonna push the, those dollars out? But as we like to say, that sometimes that's future you problems. It's not future, it's not now, now you problems. Right, right. right. Um, but no, I just think that's a huge benefit for people to be able to, you know, take those dollars and, and play the tax game, right? You should be calling your CPA now. We're in, we're in chaos time, but mm-hmm. if you want to be on the offensive, go on the offensive now. Call your CPA. Be like, hey, how do, how do I make this benefit me today? The, the rules change. Let's go to work. Right. 
You know, one of the things that we've found, and you know, since you're you're a financial planner and you financial advisor, um, we've actually found it a little difficult to to find a financial advisor uh, locally that is able to help um, use that IRA money, self directed IRAs, for example. Right. Um, can you have give us a little advice on how to find those type of people or what type of questions they should be asking? Yeah, I mean, so remember the self-directed IRA people for sure are they're in business to make money and collect fees. I and mean, that's what they do, right? That's mm -hmm. especially the big trust companies, right? I've worked with a lot of them. I wish I could tell you that all of them were awesome. As you probably with your experience, I would tell you they're probably most of them aren't awesome. Um, you know, either the account service rep changes every other, every other phone call, or you can't get money out. And it's just, it makes it kind of a nightmare to transact. Um, but so there's not a ton of, of good ones there on, on the IRA side. I mean, there's Northern trust and premier trust and some of the other ones. I don't know if I'm supposed to say names or not, but I, I just did. Nope. Um, that's fine. And they're, and they're, they're sometimes difficult to work with. What I like to recommend with clients, if they're, is to, if you have a business and you're flipping real estate or, you know, you kind of have that, that entity structure or a solo structure, mm -hmm. set yourself up a solo 401k. And guess who's in control now? You are 100%. You're, right. the, you're the TPA, you're the third party administrator, you're the custodian, you're all of it. It's you, right? Now, once you have that plan document, you can go down to the, um, you know, to the bank, open up a bank account in, your, in the name of your plan, right? Of your 401k plan, it can sponsor LLC. And it can do all that stuff and it can go out and start investing right away, right? So you basically have taken that pain of an IRA, right? And you mm -hmm. can move that IRA money back into your 401k. Now on the 401k side, there's a couple companies that we use one of them here locally, um, but it's a CPA firm that has a, um, you know, basically a solo 401k kind of for this uh, scenario where they really help those closely held businesses, closely held mom and pop their businesses, open up their 401k plans and then show them how to go out and invest and buy real estate. Sure. Um, you can go out and even do it, <clears throat> excuse me, on your like a defined benefit plan. You can buy real estate inside those. Um, and those, you know, if you're, especially if you're up in your 50s, 55, 60, I mean, you can, you can pack that thing full, chock full of money. Um, you know, some, I mean, sometimes you're looking at putting 175, $200,000 a year, getting the tax break now, going out and buying real estate with it. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously caveat there, there's lots of rules concerned with that. I mean, you guys probably have talked about the self-dealing and things like that. So you, huge no-nos. Um, but I like the 401k structure a little bit better. For one, it has better asset protection behind it. Mm -hmm. I know you have had Brian Bradley on before. So it does have much better asset protection on it. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say it's untouchable because that's not, I guess anything's touchable, especially mm -hmm. in the changing times that we have today. But so it has asset protection. And then, you know, you can, you can put a lot bigger numbers in there, right? Uh, mm -hmm. You can, you know, your, what's your max contribution on your IRA? 6,500 bucks this year, plus a catch up maybe if you're over, over age 50. Whereas in a 401k, I mean, you're pushing 55 thousand if you're over 50 now you're pushing 63 grand you know for you and your spouse so you can put away 123 grand and you guys can both both of those plans can go out and buy real estate so um anyways i just i kind of like that structure a little better because i think it, it's a little easier to use and you kind of get to not have the those big ira trust company custodians soaking up fees and, and doing all that stuff for you sure. now it does have its own its own burden you know you do have to do the administration on a 401k and file your 5500 and do all that kind of stuff Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I think that's a little bit better, um, a little bit better vehicle than just, than just a straight IRA, if that sure. makes sense. Yeah. Sorry, no. that was a, that was a long answer to your short question. Yeah, no, you know, and, and, uh, that, that was a great, that was a great answer. So, you know, when people are talking to the financial advisors, um, like I had mentioned before, like, are there some like common questions that they should ask before selecting a a financial advisor to help them with some of this stuff? Yeah, I, I would be, if you, if you say I like to invest in real estate and they immediately either tell you to buy a REIT or they want to sell you another product, that's probably a bad, that, that's the bad indication, right? Right. Um, you know, I, I would go and be like, Hey, this is what I do. I'm in the real estate business and I, I want to make this better. The other, the other flip side knows a lot of time real estate people, cause I've worked with them before. They kind of want to be the do it yourselfers and don't want to pay anybody anything. Mm -hmm. And so you can't go into somebody and try and get expert advice and then not want to pay them either. Right. That's kind yeah, of like a, yeah. kind of like that two edged sword. Right. So, um, you know, we usually either charge clients just a flat fee or, you know, I'll, I'll pass them off to the right person to make sure, you know, we have referral relationships with some of these great CPAs and some of these other custodians. So you can pass those that often, you know, they refer clients back to us at some point. 
Um, but I would, I would really ask that make sure you're not getting sold a product and make sure you're not just getting sold some other investment, right? Mm -hmm. A financial advisor should really be helping you get to where you want to be and how you do it, right? They're, they should be guiding you, helping you get to where you want to go, not putting a block and making you go a different way. Does that kind sure. of make sense? Yeah, no, it does so make that's, sense. That's kind of, that's kind of how I, I vet people is, hey, are you, are you helping me get to where I want to be and giving me good advice or are you just trying to sell me something? Sure. And if you work for some of the big, I guess I won't name names, but if you're working for some of the big wirehouses and some of the big institutional investment advisory firms, you're going to get sold a product. And they're, yeah. they're always going to be almost fighting you on the real estate investment stuff instead of being that guide along to help you. Hey, how do we take those awesome profits that you're making on your real estate side, win, with, win on the tax side, and then turn around and go back and invest it? And that should be that good symbiotic relationship. Right. Yeah, no. And, and when anytime I've brought up like the self-directed IRA or anything with, with some of the financial advisors I've talked to, um, I usually get a blank stare. Mm -hmm. um, and then or uh, uh, I get a, a call later saying because they have to check on it because they've never been taught that type of thing. And then I right. get a call later saying uh, it's something we don't offer, you know. Sure. Uh, so. Right. And the reason they don't offer is because they don't get paid on it. Right. I mean, let's just be honest. I mean, people don't want to do things and do work. They're not going to get paid on. Well, yeah, but I still think it's, I still think it's a good idea to have that kind of in your, um, you know, kind of in your, in your hip pocket for the clients that are doing it and let them go invest. Right. So, right. So other, other, you already talked about the depreciation. Are there other tax mitigation strategies that we might not be aware of or that we should probably have on our radar? Yeah. So a big one that I, I don't think a lot of people take advantage of, and even could you kind of think you're too small is uh, the federal R and D tax credits. I don't know what they're like in North Dakota, um, but in California, they're almost actually better um, in California on the state side than they're on the federal side. But you know, if you're doing any sort of research and development, and I mean, if you're getting plans and redoing plans and moving trusses and beams again, I'm going to caveat this with all advice should be followed up with a good CPA. So don't take mm -hmm. this as my advice. Go talk to your CPA. They should be able to do an R&D study for you. But we work with several CPAs here that, I mean, they find people lots of R&D tax credits. And the nice thing about that tax credit is it's, it's not a tax rebate, right? It's not lowering your adjusted gross income. They're actually giving you money back. Right. And so it's a dollar for dollar, not right. And it's not just lowering your AGI. So I think the tax credit is a big one that's, um, that's missed very significantly the R and D tax credit. And it can be used for lots of it. Everybody thinks like, Hey, do I have to go create something or am I have to design something or am I inventing something to do R and D? No, if you're, we, we do it for uh, a garage door installation company, right? They mm. do lots of custom garage door installs. And so when the plans come in from the big builders, they're like, no, we have to do a custom on this one and do a side mount garage door. They're able to take some of that time and do the R and D on it and basically get a tax break for doing some of that. So I think that's highly missed and that's a pretty easy one. And they can go back and look at those for three years for you, right? So if you've been doing this for multiple years and been working, talk to your CPA, they might be able to go back up to three years and, and get you three years worth of R&D tax credits, which is a so, huge deal. So pretty much anything, if you have to cut, do any kind of custom type work or? or Anything where you're researching and, and, and basically changing and fixing something, right? You're doing, yes. Now, all that being said, go talk to your CPA. But yes, if you're doing any sort of that type of work where you're doing, if you're basically taking plans that are given to you and you have to go and fix the plans and change something, that's basically considered research and development, right? Now, sure. however your CPA interprets that can be, you know, there's a lot of ways you can interpret that, but it, it is a big one that's missed. And there was even, when I first kind of got into this business and started using some of these CPAs, I wouldn't refer them business because I'd be like, oh, there's no way this client will even ever need, you know, it's not a thing, right? Mm -hmm. And my CPA is like, oh, absolutely not. Shoot me their website. And I mean, you know, when you, when you get a check back for fifteen, twenty, thirty thousand dollars, that's that's real dollars back in your pocket. Yeah. And that you're like, wow, that that totally changed my world this year. Right. Right. So I I have another a quick question for you then. Financial advisors. I I have always I used to be in banking. I, yeah. I used to work at a very large, you know, behind the scenes credit card underwriting kind of a evil company. corporations, evil, yeah, big evil <laughs> corporations. But but every person who's in some sort of financial job is it's pretty much an accidental occupation. Right. You know, you you probably didn't wake up when you were a teenager and said, "I'm going to be a financial advisor." 
when you got so, in, how did you land yeah. into this type of job? And, and what surprises have you like myths that you you've un- uncovered that you just misinterpreted or you didn't expect? Yeah. Well, if, so the reason I like the finance business is probably some of the reasons you probably like real estate. It's one of the few businesses where you have a really huge upside with very minimal overhead and employees. Mm-hmm. If you ever, I, I know I have buddies that run companies and things like that. And you know what their number one headache always is, right? Mm-hmm. It's employees. Always. Yeah. Yep. I'm not saying employees are bad. They're just, they're expensive and they, you become a people manager. And so that's, mm-hmm. that's one of the reasons I got drawn to the financial business. I mean, you can basically have unlimited upside with, two, three, five employees, um, and do that. So I like that. I also, I love helping people, right? Loving giving, giving good advice and kind of showing people how to walk down a successful path. You know, we always start with our clients. If, if you can't, if you can't spend less than you make, I really can't help you. Right. Mm -hmm. Because the best investment in the world, you can't buy anyways, because you're in debt. Right. Um, not that debt is terrible. I know there's some financial gurus out there that say debt is bad and that's a whole other conversation, but I just really love helping people and putting people in, in contact with the right people. I'm kind of the ultimate connector and that's really what I like. And I feel like that's a, as an advisor, that's almost more important than picking the right stocks and bonds, right? right. That, the importance of that has come down pretty significantly um, over the last decade. You know, it used to be everybody had proprietary funds and I could go get something from Goldman Sachs that you couldn't get or, you know, whoever my private banker was. Those days are gone, right? The internet changed all of that. It totally commoditized the investment field. Um, so helping people make better decisions and, and finding these loopholes and, and tax strategies and, and how to plan better has become kind of the, the new normal, I think is more valuable than again, telling you which bond to pick right. Right, or which stock to pick. So, so if you yeah. asked me, should I have bought an Apple, uh, you know, five years ago, I would have probably say yes, cause it was cheaper than it is today. So <laughs> yeah, there's a good stock pick. <laughs> so now that you've been doing this for a while, what, what surprised you the most being a financial advisor? Yeah. Uh, this is, I kid you not, getting people to take profits. Hmm. It's the weirdest thing ever. People will, I don't know if the psychology behind this, I, I kind of understand, but it's kind of hard to understand, is that when things are good, nobody wants to quit. And I'll, I'll give you a perfect example. Um, we had a commodity trading advisor back in 2011 that was just killing it in the gold market. I mean, they doubled twice right on when gold remember when gold took that big surge from like I don't know, like sure. 100 bucks an ounce up to like almost 2000 mm-hmm. these guys absolutely uh killed it well we had clients that were picking up the phone and calling and being like hey you should now play with house money can i please send you a check for seventy five thousand dollars that you can go do whatever the freaking heck you want with and they would be like nope it's gonna double again and i'm like it's not gonna double again man that's not how i don't know if you know how statistics and math works but it's not going to Mm-hmm. or at least take half it off and let it, the other part double. That's fine too. Right. So that's been the weird thing. And again, back November, October, November, December last year, like we're going to election year. There's lots of economic macro level uncertainty in the world. We should probably rebalance portfolios and get, you know, a little more conservative. Nope. This thing is going to the moon, you know, president Trump or whoever, whoever you're, whichever side of the aisle you're on, it's going up. We're never going to stop. And it, it always stops. The music always stops playing. It has every seven right. to 10 years since the gold rush right here in California. Mm-hmm. And so that's been a really weird thing of getting people to actually go take your profits, play with house money, you know, and it's been a very, very weird thing. And you might've seen that some in your real estate portfolio, but you know, people always just think that the doubled once is going to do it again. It's like that lottery mentality. Right. And that's been a very odd thing for me to be like, just let me send you a check. Nope. I don't want you to send me a check. So it's kind of mm-hmm. a funny a funny uh, dichotomy basically in the market because when it's down it's easier people are like oh it's down everybody else is down so i'm fine i'm okay with that it's basically easier to get people to be calm when it's down than to sell when it's up which is the exact opposite of what you want to do in investing right Mm -hmm. buy low sell high but our psychology always wants to buy when everything's good when jim kramer's on tv and going everything's great and we're going to go to the moon and the Dow's going to be at 75,000. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's just not how it works. You need to, you should be selling into that and buying in weakness and people right. just, it's hard for them to do that. Yeah, well, you know, that, that brings up a good point. You know, a lot of people uh, panic sell the, the whole Correct. thing that are going on right now is a great example. The Dow and everything drops like a rock. This was probably the time to be buying what you can. 
Correct. And we had lots of conversations with those of clients. Sorry. I, sorry. No problem. So uh, with that being said, what else have you, uh, what are you seeing with some of your real estate investors? Like uh, some of the things that have surprised you or uh, you, we've already covered a couple things that they might be missing the R and D and the depreciation, but right. are there other things like things that have surprised you when you're dealing with real estate investors? Um, I would say for the novice, the rookie real estate investors, you know, they always think that, Hey, I'm, I'm going to buy this house, you know, this cash flowing property. And then I just get to let it do its thing and I disappear. Right. I, mm -hmm. I just get to check in the mail every month and everything's fine. And I always try and use the analogy. Let's, let's say, Hey, if you bought a $500,000 business and it was paying you, you know, 25, 30,000 a month, depending on whatever the rents are, right. They're a little higher in California than I think than they are in North Dakota, but you know, yeah. that's about, you know, you're getting 2000 a month. How much work would you need to do to generate that revenue? Right. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. So if people, so if you think you're just going to sit there and collect rent and it's never going to, nothing's ever going to break. The tenants aren't ever going to complain. The water heater is never going to go out. You probably shouldn't be investing in real estate or you need to recalibrate and be like, Hey, if you want those dollars, you need to do the work. Mm -hmm. There's a massive amount of work involved in being a successful real estate investor. There's no way to not do that. And so, you know, kind of basically re-educating them of real estate has a lot of huge benefits and there's tax benefits and you can start to run, you know, bills through your business and, you know, start to take some of those advantages. Mm -hmm. um, but you got to run it like a business. It's not just a magic money machine. Right. Yeah. Right. And I, I just, it's a very weird for people when they think that I just buy this house and it just makes me money and it's not, it's not true at all. So I, I like to dispel that myth early on of like, Hey, if you, if you have a million dollar real estate portfolio, I mean, go out and try and buy a million dollar business that cash flows a hundred thousand dollars a year. That's a, that's a hard business to find. I mean, that's a successful business to go out and try and buy that. And that's what you own in real estate. So you have to look at it on those, basically do that like kind comparison, right? Those apple to apple comparison, be like, how much work do I need to generate that money? And don't be afraid to do the work or be surprised when that work sure. comes around. Sure. Yeah. So, well, you know, I'm going to change the conversation on you a little bit sure, because I'm, I'm, I'm always curious about, um, being a financial advisor, I'm going to guess that there, at least early on, uh, there's a lot of cold calling and there's a lot of getting your mindset right and, and getting things, getting yourself motivated. What do you do to, uh, yeah, I mean, you're a pretty chipper guy. I mean, we're sitting here talking about this stuff and you've had a smile on your face the entire time. Like, <laughs> what, do you, what do you do to maintain that motivation? Um, because I mean, that, that's, that's one of the things when it comes to real estate, I mean, it is a big part is lead generation and, and staying in front of it and finding that motivation. So what do you do to, to stay motivated? Yeah. I, you know, when I first started coming to this business, I, I kind of had a couple of mentors or, and people I knew that had been in the business a long time. And the big thing for them was you got to stay with it. You have to give it five years. If you think you're going to, you know, Everybody likes to talk about the overnight success, right? Just like in real estate. Like I, mm -hmm. I found the house that I paid, you know, 22,000 and flipped it for 150 in three weeks. I mean, that's just, that doesn't happen all the time, right? It's like, right. it's like the one guy that comes into the financial advising business, gets a $10 million client and he's making his hundred grand, you know, day one out the gate. That just doesn't, that's not realistic, right? There's the other right. 10,000 people that basically leave the business because they just can't make it. So they were like, Hey, give yourself that five year horizon. Um, and the first two to three, I mean, it's a grind. I mean, you just got to go after it and go after it and go after it and keep going after it. And there's going to be days when I should quit. This is not working, you know, as the bank account's dwindling or whatever, it's just not going to work. Um, and then you get those little victories and the victories start to build. But the, with the work ethic and you take care of your clients, guess what? The referrals start to come in. And that's when it gets, I wouldn't say the word is easier, but that's just when the dynamic changes, right? You, yeah. Every once in a while you get, somebody calls you. And that the phone is like, Hey, I have this, I have a client or I would like a referral or here you, and you're like, Oh, this does work. And it, it did. It took about five years of, of, you know, the grind to get, you know, comfortable. And we're like, okay, I, this, this is going to work now. Now, obviously the dynamics of the financial advising world has changed pretty significantly. Also, mm -hmm. there's been fee compression and things like that. So, you know, you kind of have to work a little harder to make the same amount of money you're probably making, you know, 10 years ago. Right. Um, but you gotta just stay motivated and keep going and give yourself that realistic timeline, right? Like if you know, you can't make it that five years, you either got to work that much harder or go get a corporate job, you know, and you right. know, polish right. up the old resume and get ready to go work somewhere else. 
And so that's, sure. you know, that's just, give yourself those realistic expectations. I think right. is the better, is the, it takes that pressure off of you to know that if, if you're failing, you're not really failing. You're kind of just in the mean, right? You're kind of mm-hmm. just normal. Sure. Um, and don't look at those kind of pie in the sky numbers and be like, Oh, Hey, that, you know, I'm going to hit it tomorrow. Cause you're not going to. Sure. So I know that, uh, you have a podcast as well, right? We do. Yeah. Um, it's called the wealth preservation podcast. Um, and it, it's kind of, it's kind of cool cause we get to talk to some really neat, we talk to mostly entrepreneurs, right. And mm-hmm. people that have made it and how did they make it? And they do interesting stuff. It's always, it, it always interests me to figure out how do people make money? Right. I mean, you do it in real estate, you find these really niche people that you're like, I didn't even know that was a thing and mm-hmm. you're killing it at it. That's amazing. Right. And once you yeah. start talking like, Oh, that really makes sense. Um, just with that bent on um, what, what's your success stories and then kind of what, what were your failures and then what do you do now to succeed? And we talked some about some employees and then how do we just kind of protect that? Because, you know, businesses and economy cycle again, like we've seen over the last, last six weeks, and, you know, how do you adapt and change to that? What was a great idea, you know, five years ago might be the worst idea today, you know? I would mm-hmm. say if you're in the medical equipment making uh, business, you probably are hitting a gold mine right now, right? Especially right. if you're making N95 masks. Um, so, and just keeping that pressure on, you know, keeping that push on and, and at figuring out how they did it and then bringing those stories to people. And then we also interview the advisors or people that, that we talk to and we have questions that we don't know about, right? I mean, sure. I'll be the first person to admit, I don't, I actually know very little, but I do know a whole bunch of smart people and we have a great working relationship. So if I run into a problem or I have a question or something like that, I can shoot them an email and they're going to, they're going to get back to me like, Oh, this is how I'd solve that problem. This is how I would do it. Or if they don't know, they're going to send me the right person to talk to. Right. I think that becomes a really valuable thing um, just for listeners to how do you solve complex problems? Cause everybody likes to give like one dimensional pr- fixes to complex mm-hmm. solutions. And I don't think, I don't believe that works. Sure. So where do they find your podcast again? Yeah, it's a uh, wealth preservation uh, We're on uh I, uh, Apple podcast. So I keep want to call it iTunes podcast, Apple podcast and Spotify. <laughs> and then we also record them video wise and they're up on YouTube also. Sure. So um, if you want to watch the videos, uh, hop on and log on. So I know our, our kind of uh, conversation kind of took uh, different turns here, but was there a question that you wished I would have asked you tonight? Um, go get a good CPA. If there's one place you don't want to scrimp in your business, and basically the question would be like, who, who do you go to or advice? Go find a good aggressive CPA. And I'm going to, I'm going to kind of caveat that with, if your CPA only talks to you between January and April 15th tax deadline, you have a bad CPA. Mm-hmm. You should be doing tax planning the year prior in September, October, November, and figuring out stuff. Because once that January 31st deadline passes, you have zero opportunity to fix anything. Sure. And all that, all that non-aggressive CPA does is reports damage to you. So that probably the, probably the most important piece in that in your financial world is having a really, really good CPA and that keeps you on the straight and narrow and also will, you know, do great things for you because they're going to show you what's making money and what's not and help minimize your taxes because you have a really bad silent business partner um, in the IRS and they have no problem taking checks. Yeah. No. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, that's, that's interesting you bring up the CPA because uh, that's another thing that w- we frankly have struggled finding a uh, CPA that act- actually can act a bit like a consultant as mm-hmm. much of as, you know, actually being that trusted advisor. Um, because like you said, many of them like to uh, report damage versus help helping you out or, or giving you some advice. Right. I don't know and if it's like- maybe they just don't want the responsibility or... <laughs> well, I, I, I can give, if we, if we want to kind of go down that path, I can kind of give you some, you know, anecdotal evidences. They have a business model that they prepare taxes. That's what they do. Mm-hmm. That's all they, and, and people go out and have just given, you know, basically people look at the CPS, I want a service. So I give you my three, 500, 10,000, whatever your business size is. Right. You, you report my taxes to the IRS and we go on to the next year. And you have to see that CPA as a consultant, as a better consultant. And to bring them in, kind of like you said, and be like, hey, no, I want to meet in September, October. And what can we do today to mitigate my bill April 15th? How do we do that together? Do I need to buy something? Do I need to buy a car? Should I accelerate some depreciation? Or should I push a payment off into January? So I get my, te- you know, and have that consult- consultative role. Um, but the problem is the CPAs, uh, their business is dying on the lower end, right? I mean, 
trust me, TurboTax and h and Block on the bottom side are trying to eat that lower end, that sub $500 tax repair for lunch all day long. So if we can, uh, you know, go find those good CPAs that are aggressive and know what they're talking about, you're going to end up way better. If anybody needs a couple of referrals, there's a couple of great ones out here in California that we use. They can work all over the country. They're super awesome. Um, and people always get weird when you say the word aggressive when it comes to CPAs. So they always think you're doing something kind of shady, right? Right. Um, like you're, you know, like, oh, you should move money over into Malta or, you know, some weird craziness, right? No, you just want to find a CPA that knows exactly what he's doing. Is going to, you know, knows the tax law and is going to go right up to the line and get you every dollar that you, that you deserve is rightfully yours. Because the IRS right. isn't going to tell you that you overpaid. Right. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, you know, I really appreciated your time here tonight, Joshua. And, and uh, you gave the information regarding your podcast, but if, other, if they had any questions uh, just to follow up with you, how would they reach you? Yeah. Uh, you can go to our, the website again, wealthpreservationpodcast.com. Click on uh, connect with us, or you can shoot me a, an email at jsaunders at kingsviewam.com. And those will come right to my inbox. And, you know, probably like everybody, I respond to a lot of emails, especially as of lately. So we'll get back to you pretty quickly. So, well, I really appreciate your time, and I hope we can do it again sometime. Jack, thank you so much, bud. It's stay warm back there in North Dakota. Yeah. Like I said, <laughs> we've been oscillating between snow and 40, 50 degree weather, and then it'll snow again. So. Yeah, it's that time of year. Yeah, that time of year. Well, thank you again. Jack, thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. Yeah, you too. We've put a lot of effort into providing useful content, and if you've found value in the show and have any interest in supporting us with a small donation, head over to patreon.com slash housedudes. And if you have any thoughts or questions, shoot us an email at info at housedudes.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at housedudes. And if you like what you're hearing, head over to iTunes, subscribe, rate, and review the podcast. It really helps other investors out there find the show. And remember, massive positive impact requires massive positive action. We'll see you next time. This episode is brought to you by HouseDudes.com. Do you have time to actively manage flipping and rentals yourself? If so, go for it. If you live in a market that won't cash flow or don't have the time to do all the work, are you just out of luck? If there was a way to participate more passively, would that appeal to you? I'm sure you have questions about how the process works and what to do next. If that's the case, fill out the form on housedudes.com slash investors, and we'll reach out to see if you are a good fit for our business. This is first come first serve, and we will have to stop taking applications when our goals are met. See you at housedudes.com slash investors. a man what to do with his money but if you ain't investing in property then you're dumber than a dummy i'm not dumb i'm smart well buy property that's my advice